Well, thank, thank you. Thank you very much, um, um, Professor, and uh, thank you very much to, to all the organizers of this event and, and indeed also for the audience for this Monday morning event, as you so, so aptly uh, pointed out already. Um, some years ago, uh, Andrea and Ria, my, 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 my colleague and, and the chair of the uh, supervisory board, gave a speech uh, precisely at the um, EBI conference uh, calling for greater transparency in prudential supervision. And when describing the role of transparency and information disclosure, he echoed the words of a US Supreme Court justice, uh, Louise Brandeis, um, who said, sunlight is said to be the best of disinfectants, electric light, the most efficient policeman. And this couldn't be truer for climate related disclosures. As I have said before, when discussing the supervision and prominence of climate related and environmental or C and E risks, we can only tackle the problem once we get a good grip on its shape and size. Some information may be uncomfortable to face up to, but bringing it to light is the first step in making progress. When it comes to climate change, the information on what Al Gore famously dubbed as an inconvenient truth is indeed getting bleaker by the day. The most recent IPCC report confirms the dramatic consequences of not taking immediate action. Additional global warming of up to 1.5 degrees Celsius in the near term would increase climate hazards and present numerous risks to ecosystems and human society. Europe, in particular, is badly affected as temperatures here continue to rise above the mean and despite our efforts to reduce CO2 emissions, we lag far behind in terms of what we need to do to adapt to some of the inevitable consequences. It is time we face the facts. As citizens, as institutions, and as all actors in the economy, including, of course, banks. It is essential that banks share with their stakeholders detailed information on their exposures to C and E risks. Only then we can all effectively work together to address the consequences of climate change. And this is why today I would like to draw your attention to another important landmark in the ECB supervision of climate and environmental risks the publication of our second stock take on the transparency of banks' disclosures of their c &E risk profiles. Publishing this update is part of our supervisory agenda on climate. As you know, c &E risks have been one of our supervisory priorities for some years now, and we have started treating them just like any other prudential risk. In this context, we have been rolling out a series of corresponding supervisory activities. In 2020, we published our guide on climate related and environmental risks, which outlined our supervisory expectations relating to the management and disclosure of CE risks. In 2021, we published a self assessment benchmarking report. And in 2022, we launched a climate risk stress test and a thematic review on how banks incorporate CE risks into their processes. A fully fledged supervisory exercise involving teams responsible for the day to day supervision of banks, the joint supervisory teams. At the same time, we are gradually integrating CE risks into our regular supervisory methodology 
and how banks manage these risks will ultimately impact their Pillar 2 capital requirements. The ECB's supervisory actions on climate are part of a broader international effort to advance the supervision and regulation of CME risks. At a global level, the Basel Committee on Banking Supervision recently concluded a public consultation on draft supervisory principles for the prudential treatment of climate-related risks. And the input they received is now being reviewed with the aim of finalizing these supervisory principles. This is part of a broader work plan of the, of the Basel Committee to evaluate how to consider climate-related financial risks in all pillars of the Basel framework, supervision, regulation, and the topic of the ECB report that is published this morning, disclosures. There is growing international awareness of the great value of transparent disclosures. Disclosures that are clear and easy to understand tend to benefit any company banks included generally companies have strong incentives to publish frank and meaningful disclosures because transparency is usually rewarded by investors it helps reduce uncertainty and allows all interested parties to feel that they are making safe investments based on trustworthy data this is particularly true for climate-related and environmental risks. As the materiality of physical and transition risks increases by the day, investors are on the lookout for those companies that proactively take these risks into account in their daily operations and across all their activities. One of the essential functions of financial markets is to price risks and thus support informed and efficient capital allocation decisions. The accurate and timely disclosure of current and past operating and financial results is central to that function. And to make it more concrete, the more transparent banks are about their CE risk profiles and their concrete efforts to align their portfolios with the Paris Agreement, the easier it is for market participants to compare banks, to reward those which are taking the necessary, the necessary steps to adopt risk management practices aligned with the carbon neutral economy and to re-evaluate re those with misaligned trajectories. Transparent disclosures also create a certain level of peer and stakeholder pressure, which is essential to making companies properly manage these risks. Investors and asset managers are seeking to develop and market portfolios that are aligned with the sustainable objectives of their clients. As such, they are becoming increasingly demanding about corporate c &E disclosures. Banks' own shareholders are becoming increasingly demanding too especially concerning banks that have publicly committed to achieving net zero targets. In fact, failure to disclose meaningful follow-up information on their climate commitments has actually already led to significant litigation and given rise to heightened reputational and legal risks for some banks. Recent regulatory and legislative initiatives reflect growing international awareness of the great value of transparent disclosures on CME risks. In Europe, large banks will have to disclose climate-related information under the European Banking Authority's comprehensive implementing technical standards. They will have to already do so by early 2023, referencing data from the end of 2022. And the information requested from banks includes qualitative and quantitative information on environmental, social, and governance risks, as well as indicators such as 
alignment metrics and the green asset ratio, thus significantly raising the bar in terms of c &E risk reporting. In the same vein, sustainability reporting obligations under the European Commission's Corporate Sustainability Reporting Directive will shortly apply to large corporations, including banks, under our direct supervision. Now, the ECB is also well aware of the importance of transparent disclosures. We published our first stock take of banks' c &E disclosures back in November 2020. And we did so precisely to give banks the time and the incentive to improve the quality of their own disclosures in this field. Back then, virtually none of the institutions in the scope of the assessment met our expectations, as set out in the ECB Guide on Climate-Related and Environmental Risks, which we published back then at the same time. Now, the second stock take, the one we published today, shows that the quality of banks' disclosures has improved since then, especially in the areas of risk management, governance, and business models. However, this improvement has only been marginal. As of 2021, as of 2021, seven in 10 banks disclosed information about c &E risk management and governance, compared to five in 10 in 2020, while only four in 10 shared relevant information about the incorporation of c &E risks into their strategic considerations, up from three in 10 in 2020. And all in all, none of the 115 banks directly supervised by the ECB fully meets our supervisory expectations for disclosures. Now, there is very little justification for this lack of substantial progress, particularly considering the vast amount and quality of climate-related data, tools, and information shared by different international and European organizations and institutions in recent years. The sheer speed at which regulations and metrics are developing in this field should leave no room for any doubt. Addressing climate-related and environmental risks and publishing good quality disclosures is not and must do much better to improve the quality of their disclosures, and they need to do so quickly. However, we see a considerable disconnect between banks' perception of the importance of c &E risks as communicated to us, the supervisor, and what banks choose to publicly disclose. Banks are trying to compensate for the poor quality of their disclosures by issuing a great volume of information around green topics. And we end up with a lot of white, no white noise and no real substance on what both markets and supervisors really want to know. How exposed is a bank to c &E risks and what is, it, what, what is it doing to manage that exposure? It is of course relevant for banks to, to publicize their efforts to, for example, reduce the electricity com consumption of their branches. However, it would of course be much more significant if they were to announce how they are steering their activities towards risk management practices that are aligned with a carbon neutral economy. Looking at the world through green colored glasses is not quite the same as a sound management of all material c &E risks. We also observe a lack of concrete detail in how banks substantiate their climate-related and environmental metrics and targets. For example, when reporting 
on their commitment to align with the Paris Agreement, only around one in five institutions disclose the methodologies, definitions, and criteria for all of the figures, metrics, and targets reported as material. More than one third of institutions do not disclose these aspects at all. And in light of the increasing importance of such commitments, interested parties will increasingly seek information on these alignment metrics and banks disclosures must become meaningful in this regard. Now there are best practices. Like many other institutions and agencies, the ECB is committed to sharing the best practices that we have found across the industry. Not only do they serve as inspiration for banks who need to catch up, they also show that the ECB's expectations can, in fact, be met. For example, one of the banks under our direct supervision published its own climate strategy, which aims at achieving net zero emissions for its lending portfolio by 2050 or sooner. In tandem with a number of interim targets and related metrics, as well as the progress made in meeting that. For each of these targets and metrics, the bank discloses the sectors covered, the underlying methodology, and the scenarios used to draw up benchmarks. For the methodologies and scenarios, it reports on the options it, it, it chose, the data sources it used, and the changes is made with respect to the previous disclosure. Another example of a good practice or a best practice, another bank endeavored to align its portfolios with science-based transition pathways, including technology pathways originating from the International Energy Agency's Net Zero by 2050 report. The bank disclosed dash dashboards that display the performance of its loan books in various transition sectors, such as power generation, oil and gas, automotive, steel, cement, and real estate against a science-based transition pathway. It also disclosed the precise indicators used, the underlying methodologies and the reference scenarios for each indicator. For each of the indicators, the bank then disclosed its current and projected performance against the pathway and the set associated targets. Importantly, many of the banks raising the bar in CNE disclosures are small and medium sized, showing that remarkable progress is achievable by all. Now, let me now outline the next steps that ECB plans to take, that the ECB tends to take, to follow up on the results of our assessments of banks' CNE disclosures. What we have done is send individual feedback letters to all banks under our direct supervision, setting out the key gaps in their disclosures and conveying our explicit expectation that they will take decisive action to address these gaps. In doing so, the banks will ultimately ensure that their risk profile is transparently and comprehensively reflected in the information that they disclose to the public. Addressing such gaps will also mean banks are well prepared to meet impending technical requirements. And as I mentioned, the consequences of non-compliance with minimum transparency standards are only going to increase for the banks as legal and reputational risks are starting to materialize for banks which fail to step up the quality of their disclosures. More and more clients investors and other market participants want meaningful and comprehensive information on the climate related actions of their banks and that way they can make conscious informed decisions about where their money goes moreover failing to disclose exposure to risks including cne risks constitutes a breach of the capital requirements regulation as such we stand ready to use the full array of supervisory tools at our disposal to ensure 
bank c &E disclosures are up, are up to our standards. And ultimately, that eligible banks are prepared for the new regulatory requirements. The ECB, in addition, publishes a yearly report on banks' Pillar 3 disclosures, where we also have the option to publicly list those banks which repeatedly fail to disclose their c &E risks. In view of the poor results shown by our stock take, and to assess the extent to which the banks address individual feedback, c &E risk disclosures will continue to feature prominently in the ECB supervision. And we will assess bank c &E disclosures again at the end of 2022, and we expect to see major progress by then. Let me conclude. Stricter disclosure regulation is underway, and time is running out for banks to get ready. Five years have passed since the Task Force on Climate-Related Financial Disclosures published its recommendations. There are also many initiatives, some of them open source, to support banks' efforts. Many companies have improved their disclosures and now provide information that can feed into banks' own disclosures in the indicators. And for those banks that have systematically fallen behind the ECBs and the market's expectations, there is only one way forward. It is time for banks to be transparent and comprehensive with their c &E disclosures, so that by bringing them to light, we can progress from an inconvenient truth towards a desirable, a much desirable outcome for us and for all future generations. So let me end where I started. The first step to coming to grips with any inconvenient truth is full disclosure. Thank you. Thank you very much, Frank, for this very interesting presentation with the, a strong demand by the ECB for a higher level of disclosure by the banks. Um, you mentioned in your speech that um, there wasn't a lot of progress made by the banks since the last um, report on disclosure by, by the ECB. And before I hand over to the co-discussants, maybe one short question. Do you have any um, view why the banks have not made progress in the way that you hoped for or expected it to be? Is it uh, because they are busy with so many other topics or is just seeing the risk not an, on the right level of priority for them so far? Do you have any any view which you're getting out of your, your feedback from the banks? Well, well, thanks for this question, uh, Thomas. Um, you know, the, I would say that you know, the, 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 very briefly, the banks that have done their homework, they see that this is relevant, that this is material, and those who say that they think that this is actually not so material, they either have not done their homework or they haven't done it well. So it's relevant, and I think that that. Um, the, 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 you know, the, the, the awareness has, of course, you know, uh, been, been, uh, been growing, uh, growing progressively and, you know, speeches like, like the one I just gave are, are also intended to, to their, to in those quarters where that awareness maybe is not yet at the right level to, to raise that. Um, you know, I also made the point uh, that, uh, you know, there's now, now lots of information available. Uh, so just looking back and, you know, and, and, and continuing to say what maybe two, three years ago was still very relevant uh, is increasingly becoming less, less relevant. Um, um, when I say doing homework, it means that you realize as a bank and that you actually go, you know, painstakingly through uh, what is the information that you need. Um, so even if there's information gaps, if there's data gaps, at least you know what is the information that you would need. And not all banks have gone through that. Uh, and those that have, not all have then um, um, uh, formulated um, uh, key performance indicators. Um, so, so yes, there is um, uh, progress. There are good practices. That's also a point that, that I think is very important to make. Our um, expectations are being met, um, but um, so it can be met, uh, but not by all banks and not all expectations by all banks. Um, but the good news is that it is possible. It is possible across business models. It's possible across sizes of banks, across uh, jurisdictions. 